Mm. Yeah, this. Wow, what was his name? Kale. Kale. Wow. Mm. Oh, wow. That's, a, that's how we had uh, Elijah's middle name. 53. Wow. This is our third child. Third. Uh-huh. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Do we have any other prayer requests or anything? Or uh, is Miss Nancy's in the hospital too? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and pray for them. Father, thank you, God, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Lord, we lift up um, Aunt Bible tonight. Lord, you know what she's going through. You know the tragedy that she's seen and, and been through, Lord. And this is the, with her grandson, Kel, Lord. You know, God, 53 years old, is, is, we were still young, God, so... Lord, just be with her, Lord. And we know that you've walked with her through these tragedies over the years. And so, God, we just ask that you keep your hand upon her. Lord, God, show her mercy. Um, show, her some, show her grace, Lord. Lord, um, we lift everybody up here tonight that's not feeling well. Lord, we lift Miss Nancy. Yeah, we... Um, uh, pray for her peace and comfort, Lord, and, and the upcoming surgery, God. So, Lord, we just lift these names and people up to you, God, for healing. As always, Lord, we, we pray for a um, quick turnaround, Lord, but sometimes we know that, that doesn't happen, Lord. But, God, but we know that no matter what happens, Lord, you walk you walk through the valley with us and you're on top of the hills with us as well. So, God, we we love you and we thank you for everything in your name. Amen. Um, um, so tonight is going to be in John um, chapter 8 verses 1 through 11 and so I'll go ahead and read from God's word Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives and early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken into adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken, into adul taken in adultery in, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such be stoned. 
But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he had heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone. And the woman standing in the midst, when Jesus lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Let's go ahead and pray over the word as well. So, Father, Lord, we come to you again tonight, Lord. And, um, Lord, we've already lifted up those in prayer, Lord. We, we ask that you um, be with the preacher and be with the congregation, Lord, as we, we, we study your word, Lord God, as we deliver your word. And, Lord, just be with us and help correct any error. And Lord, just uh, as we study, God, we just ask for your blessing in your name. Amen. So tonight I, I picked this passage. It was intentional. Um, it, but it's probably kind of for a reason that we, we wouldn't expect. I, I didn't pick this passage tonight because I wanted to uh, specifically point out adultery or anything like, anything like that, which sometimes we, we have to as a church. But I was in um, officer development school recently up there in ODS. And uh, when you get up there, you, you try to find someone to cling on to. You try to find friends. So 80% of our class was medical students. And um, there was probably about 15 of us chaplain and chaplain candidates. So um, naturally, I gravitated toward the, the, the chaplain side of the house because it had more in common. Um, but what you find out, too, is when you, when you, when you do gravitate toward uh, the chaplaincy, you find out that not everybody holds the same biblical worldview that we do. Um, one of my uh, chaplain buddies, or um, I would say colleague, um, we got to a conversation and we got to talking about the Word of God, you know, naturally. And he said that he, be, he does not believe that the, the Bible is inerrant. And so that, that kind of actually shocked me because cause realistically, he's a pretty good guy. I mean, he, he was, uh, he's a good man, I think, and, 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 and all, uh, I guess, from a human standpoint. But to hear, to hear him say that, it's not that it shocked me, but, you know, it, it's, I don't meet many in leadership levels that will, will actually say that. I've met those that are in the church that say that the Bible's not errant, there's errors. Um, but when, you, when, when it comes to leadership and, and the circles that I've been in, it's, everybody pretty much agrees that God, you know, the Word of God is inerrant. And so... I didn't get into an argument with him, nothing like that. It was just one of those things that he's, he was expressing his view, and um, I, I disagree, you know. Um, but in that environment, you've got to be careful. <laughs> um, and you, it's, troubling. it's troubling. It is troubling. And, and, you, and the military is unique because when you're in chapel, here we have the, we have the uh, opportunity to, to fellowship with one of each other with like beliefs. Um, but when you're in chapel in the military, you might, have, you might be sitting alongside of someone that's a, a church of God or a Pente uh, Pentecostal Assemblies of God or, or, or the person in front of you might be Presbyterian. Um, you're, you're Baptist. Uh, you have Methodist. So there's, there's really a whole um, cl uh, cloud or crowd of people that don't share maybe your same denom dom denominational views um, but we but we get along and 
But oftentimes you don't hear anybody say that the, the Bible's not inerrant either. I mean, even though there's, I can sit in a, on a pew in, in a chapel service in the military and I, I might be, I have, have a Presbyterian to my left and a Methodist to my right. But we all agree that the Bible is the Word of God without error. And so my question to him was, well, why do you feel, I did kind of prod a little bit, so why do you feel that the Bible is an error? I already knew why. I've, I've studied it, but... And he, he got into textual variants. And so um, I got up there on the board. It's the, I got a picture of a Greek New Testament. And so I actually use this when I study because I like to look at the Greek. It's, I can't say, at one time I probably could read half of it. <laughs> but I haven't, you know, when you don't stay in practice, you know, you, you, you kind of get out of step with it. But uh I still probably can read 25% of it, but my goal one day is when I'm done with all this seminary stuff and have time, I'll, um, I'll get good at it. So I've actually got it open tonight. So um, there's the cover of the hard, uh, that's, that's what we call the Greek New Testament here. This is one of the versions, it's the uh, fifth edition. Um, we can go ahead and click the next slide. So we're going to talk about this here. The introduction is, what did Jesus write in the sand? And so what I'm doing tonight is we're going to do a brief, I mean, when I mean brief, we're going to do a 30,000 foot high brief overview of what textual criticism is and what textual variants are. And then we're going to kind of dive into the verse we just read and talk about that because I found out something interesting and I thought it was pretty neat. And you, you got, you probably, all you seasoned people, when I tell you this, you're already going to be like, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> what took you so long, you know? <laughs> but it was neat to hear it. Um, so anyways, so my question tonight would be, what did Jesus write in the sand? Okay, all right, so we'll move on to the next slide. Now, again, like I was telling you uh, just now, is I'm going to briefly go over textual criticism because honestly, this may be the first time you've ever heard that word in the church and, uh, and maybe those that are watching. Or that one person that's watching. <laughs> and, uh, but textual criticism is really about um, the discipline, as you can see up there, number one, the discipline to reconstruct the wording of, the ori of an original document. And while that's important with the Bible, is because every one of us here knows as much as we would love to have all original manuscripts of the Bible, we just don't have them anymore. There are no original manuscripts. And they were written on papyri, more than likely, even if, even if we could find them, more than likely, uh, they would, would have been des destroyed through weather and different things within the first 100 or 200 years, possibly. Because they don't have preservation pr uh, practices like we have nowadays. And actually, nowadays, um, there's, a, there's a guy named Dan Wallace who has the Center for New T Testament Studies. He's actually digitizing the manuscripts we do have nowadays. As of just a few, and I don't know if we know this, but as of just a few hundred years ago, we only had, we had less than a hundred copies of manuscripts. So we were writing the Bible, or not writing, not writing, <laughs> copying uh, and translating the Bible into English in different languages just from less than a hundred manuscripts, copies of the manuscripts. So we went, we've went through a hundred to now we've, we have 5,500. 5,500. So um, the second point up there you'll see is what is a textual variant? This is where the, my buddy or colleague was saying the Bible's not inerrant because it has too many variants. And the problem with that argument is that just because something has a variant doesn't mean it's in error. So, for example, I may spell dog, D-O-G, and you may spell dog, D-A-W-G. But if I said I took the dog out for a walk and I wrote it down and you said, and I spelled it D-O-G, and you said you took a dog out for a walk and you spelled it D-O-G, everybody knows what you're saying. It doesn't change the spirit of, of, of the text. And what, what we realize is what a text, so with textual criticism, we recreate, you have 
hundreds and thousands of these manuscripts that we can compare scripture to and the more very I'm sorry more the more manuscripts we're finding the closer and closer and closer we're getting to the original text manuscript and that to me is incredibly amazing because if I was to say I have one document well if I have one document or one manuscript or something there are going to be no variants because you don't have nothing to bounce it off of but if I have 20 now we have 20 like the gospels for example you have four gospels from four different angles because we have four gospels and they're coming from four different vantage points it makes the it makes the gospels that much deeper and nobody can accuse us of uh photocopying you know what i mean or or saying well you're y'all they all saw the same thing you know anybody that's been anybody that's had to talk to a police officer if they've seen a car wreck you can see the same car wreck you can see the same car wreck and ask four different people and they will give you four different versions of that car wreck but each version signifies what they saw and proves there was an accident so that's that's what textual variants do is that if you have one document you have zero textual variants you don't really have a whole lot to go off of if you have thousands of documents now you can compare and and you can uh, basically gather the documents and, and actually build your case a little better so uh, in that um, the scriptures we know were written by roughly 40 authors over 1600 years okay now, we know that 40 authors were inspired by God. And God did not put them in a trance. God, they didn't, they didn't go to sleep one night and God took their arm and started making them right. We know that. God used the character, the personality of that individual, just like if he would have had us today write it, he would, he would, he would allow you to use your personality, but he's going to inspire you with, with what he wants you to say. Um, so that's why when you read the different gospels or the different epistles, um, you're going to see the flavor. That's how we know Peter wrote certain letters. That's how we know Paul wrote certain, and John, because they had their own style, and God used their uniqueness, that he, how he created them, and he used them as inspiration to write his holy word. And that's how we know, uh, or that's how we understand inspired scripture to be the word of God. So when it comes to translations, we all know that... Um, Every, every translation committee, didn't matter what version you use, had a, had a committee, you know, had a committee. And they were entrusted to uh, be as faithful to the text as possible. But we have to also understand that no matter what version we use today, whether we're using an English version or, or, or a Japanese version, whatever, um, it's a translation. Those, that committee was not inspired, Okay. And we know that when you're trying, the Bible was written in Greek and the Bible was written in Hebrew and Aramaic. We know that to get the, 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 the actual Hebrew or the actual Greek or the actual Aramaic, we know that when we translate it over to a different language, there's going to be some, uh, I don't call it error. I, I'm saying it's going to be some differences. Um, did you know that you can, uh, Jesus loves Mary, I believe is what it is. Jesus loves Mary in the Greek, you can write Jesus loves Mary over a thousand times a thousand different ways because those of you that have done Latin in here understand case endings so uh, that's what's great about Greek is that you can put Jesus loves Mary Mary you know Jesus is uh, Mary's love by Jesus you can take the, the the Greek and you can swap around and, do, and swap all the words around because the case endings it's not like English you know where you have a subject and a, uh, a direct object and predicate and all that it has to go in a certain order in English. Well, in Greek, it don't have to. You can take the order and flip them around what, whatever way you want to. And you can write Jesus loves Mary a thousand different ways. Literally, a thousand different ways. That's actual, <laughs> literal thousand. Um, so, um, so anyway, so we're translating that stuff over. Sometimes in, in the English, we have to add words from the Greek. Not add as in change it, but we have to fill in. Uh, yeah. 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 Right. Right. Yes. There's some words we don't know that we don't know. 
you know. So, but that's what's neat about it. Like in, in the Greek, pronouns, formal names are, will have a definite article in the front, the. So I'd be called the Aaron and y'all would be called the whatever your name is. That's just how they did it. That's how the Greek is. So, um, so yeah, 40 authors, the Holy Scriptures, Greek, Hebrew, uh, Aramaic, inspired by God. Um, and so, but we have faithful committees that are supposed to be faithful to the text that translate it. We know they're not inspired, but we know that, you know, hopefully the committee has enough members on the board, enough Christians on the board that can check each other and their scholars. Um, so what I'm saying is the, the, the translation you're holding in your hand, um, we, can say, we can safely say it's the Word of God, okay? We don't have to, to shy away from it. We don't have to um, be afraid of it. So, uh, so we'll move to point number four. This is what I love here. This is my, this is my, I love this. We have 5,500 copies of the Greek manuscript alone. 5,500. They keep discovering there's a, there's a place in Munster, Germany. And again, Dan Wallace's uh, institute here in America they go all, all over the world and they're finding these different uh, manuscripts. And sometimes what they're finding is they're finding this manuscript actually was a part of that manuscript and when they put them together, so it, it went from being one to less. So it, you actually l lost a manuscript in count, but it, you actually, it's not that you lost any, it's just that they were together and they're not separated. And so, uh, so when we, we have people that challenge us in our faith, they say, well, how do you know the Bible's reliable? Well, because we have 5,500 Greek copies of the manuscripts. We have over 10,000. Matter of fact, the, the total number, if you add the, the Coptic language, you add the Syriac, you add the Greek, you add uh, the, the, the Latin, if you were to add all the copies together, there'd be 20,000 copies of the manuscripts. And yet our classical writers like Homer and Tertu, all them classical writers, they, if you were to get, put it this way, and I'm going to get to that slide, so I'll wait on that because <laughs> I don't want to mess the next slide up. Uh, okay, so uh, passages in question, we just read one tonight. That's why I read it tonight. One of the passages that are in question was the, uh, the woman caught in adultery. And the reason why I bring this stuff up because when I'm in ODS, and I have somebody, one of my colleagues, tell me that he doesn't believe the Bible's inerrant because uh, there's textual variance. And again, there are 138,000, I think it is 138,000 uh, verses in the New Testament, I believe is what it is. Over 500,000 variants within 138,000 words meaning, spelling, different, but it doesn't change the meaning. The two major ones that they always like to point to is John, the, the, John 7, 53 to 8, 11. I, only, I read 8, 1 through 11, but it's 7, 53 through 8, 1, 11, or 8, 11. Um, that's one of the ones they like to hit us on. And another one they like to hit us on is uh, Mark, not, uh, I'm sorry, Mark 16, or the, the uh, longer ending in Mark 9 through 20. Um, and then Mark 9.29, the prayer and fasting, because a lot of translations will say prayer, um, but they're finding manuscripts that say prayer and fasting. I know the King James, we, we say prayer and fasting. Um, so they like to hit us on that, and they say, there you go, see, your Bible's inerrant, or not inerrant. And it's like, no, that, doesn't ma that, that does not make the Bible inerrant. I'm not, not inerrant, <laughs> you know. Um, we're finding uh, more, more copies of these manuscripts, and so... Um, they're saying an early, uh, like, 4th and 5th century, uh, well, well, I got it up there, it says, P, where it says P66 and P75, that's papyri, that's the uh, two different copies of manuscripts. They're like, well, we can't find them on these. Uh, this verse here, uh, the woman caught in adultery, was actually, um, you can find them in some places, and uh, at, uh, some of the manuscripts have it at the end of the John, or at the end of the book of John, some have in the book of Luke. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? They're there. And I trust, I trust that when we read this Bible here, you can trust it. It's not like it's, it's, an, it's, not like it's uh, an error, you know. So, 
Um, again, so these are the passages that they, they always like to throw in our, in, our, in our face. But again, that doesn't point to an inerrancy. As a matter of fact, when you grab all the textual variants and put them all together, you have so many things to look from. So for example, if I was to write a book right now and I had everyone in here copy my book and then I take my book and I throw it in the garbage. Now y'all, y'all have copied my book. Y'all, y'all have copied the original. And then somebody, a church comes along after you. Now they have to copy yours. And then another church comes along after them. Then they got to copy theirs that copied yours. Do you think there's going to be some differences? Probably some spelling errors. But the more of those you have, the more that you can set out in front of you, the more you can pick through and see and go, wow, the closer you get to the one I wrote. That's how trustworthy it is. That's why having textual variance is not a bad thing. It's actually a really good thing to see that. So anyways, um, I'm ready for the next slide. So I got a picture of uh, the city skyline there in New York. I hope it's New York. That's what they told me. That's what I looked up. Um, If you were to stack all of the copies of the, uh, the copies of the manuscripts we have in possession and all the pages, you could stack our manuscripts and evidence of the New Testament over four Empire State Buildings high. You could stack em- the Empire State Building, four, height, uh, four of them, on top of each other. That's how much copies of manuscripts and pages from these copies that we have of evidence. That's the Greek, that's the Syriac, Coptic, uh, Latin, all that. That's what we have. And uh, let's, uh, we'll go to the next slide. Now, everybody see this podium, the pulpit, this right here? You'll sit in a college class and you'll learn about Homer. You'll learn about all these Greek classical writers and they will stake their lives on these writers. They, they do not question these writers. But what we have to understand is that these classical writers, there were hundreds of years from the time that they wrote their original work, that original work got lost. 800 years later, someone had, co- they find copies of the original 800 years later. 1,200 years later. The Bible, we're finding copies of the original manuscript within 100 years of, of when the ink dried, when John wrote uh, whatever, you know, depending on whatever book he wrote, Revelation or, or whatever these, these apostles uh, wrote, within 100 years, we're finding copies of the original manuscript, uh, copies of the original manuscript, but yet people have doubts. They doubt that, but they don't doubt their classical writers. Who we, there's hundreds and hundreds of years between uh, that, we don't ha- that we just don't know. And guess what? The evidence for classical writings or a podium high. One podium high, four foot high. But nobody ever questions that. They say, well, we got plenty of uh, manuscripts or, or copies of manuscripts for these classical writers, and this is what you got, a podium high, as compared to if you stack up the evidence for the New Testament, actual writings and manuscripts that we have, it goes Four Empire State Buildings high, 6,400 feet, over a mile, mile and a quarter high. How much evidence do you need of the Bible? That's just the copies we have. And that's not counting the early father, early, uh, early patristic father's writings. Did you know if, if, if we were to lose all those empire, uh, all that stack, if we were to lose all that, somebody was to burn it or whatever, we could go to the Patristic Fathers' writings because they rewrote the New Testament and their writing. They have over a million pages. The early fathers uh, of the Christian fathers of the church, they, recreate, or not, they rewrote the New Testament in a lot of their uh, homilies, commentaries, different things, that if we were to lose these manuscripts here, we could go to their writings and still recreate the New Testament and it'd be reliable. So that's just, that's just the reliability of it. Um, we can go ahead and click the next slide. So I'm, oh, that didn't turn out right at all. I don't know how that worked out. It, and on my, uh, on my PowerPoint, it shows that right there as being highlighted, not. <laughs> well, it's, it's, huh. 
<laughs> I'm not trying to take away from the Bible, I promise. <laughs> but here's a picture of uh, John 8, 1 through 11 in the Greek. And notice at the bottom, those are all the notes. Uh, that, that's just uh, a lot of the scholars that got together and um, the different notes that they put at the bottom so you know that they're not, they're not just putting things out there uh, that, that, that aren't verifiable and haven't been researched. Um, so we'll go into the next uh, next slide. Hopefully that one yeah, that one's really <laughs> so. Anyways, all right. <laughs> My next one. Don't let me. What about it? Okay, I had so in PowerPoint I highlighted it with the with the yellow, and it actually shows it up highlighted like like you would a highlighter on the on you know. Well, so anyways, I wanted to show you the the Greek word. So I wanted to get back in the in the text we were reading earlier, John eight one through eleven. And what I found out was pretty neat. When you get down to verse 6, and that's supposed to be verse 6 right there. And, um, okay, <laughs> well, I can write it out, yeah. Oh, hey, she did it. All right, cool. Very good. Um, if you want to, uh, yeah, let's go back. Just let them see, let them see it. Okay. That's cool. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> there you go. That'll work. So in verse 6, um, right before verse, okay, so right before verse 7, do y'all do you see the 6? I know it may be hard, but um, it is a katagraphin ace tone gain. And so what that means is um, he began writing on the ground. Now, I got a Greek brother-in-law, and he's, he's 100% Greek. And so I sent him this passage a while back, several months ago. I said, man, I'm studying this passage. I said, can you help me out here? I said, I, I, I get the, the syntax of it, but I'm not going to tell you what it says because my brother-in-law, he's a Eastern Orthodox uh, in, in, in Greece, in the Eastern Orthodox churches in America, when they read the Holy Scriptures on, 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 uh, in, their, in their service, they read from the, the Greek. The, the, the Greek. That's what they do. So, um, but it's ancient Greek. This is Koine Greek. It's not modern Greek. So, my, <laughs> anyway, so I sent this passage to my brother-in-law, and I said, what does this word mean? It's, it's right there. Uh, if we go to the next slide, Anna. Um, so right there, if you look at the fourth word over, that one right there, yep, where it says began writing, and then, then it's got it transliterated up at the top in English. Kategrafen. Yeah. So I sent that, kategrafen, then it says ace tone gain, which uh, writing on the ground. So I sent, I sent that to my brother-in-law. I, didn't want, I just want to see what he says. And within a minute, might have been a minute. I don't even know. It might have been quicker. He texted me back to make a record. To make a record. In the Greek. But it translated to English. And so we see up here it says began writing. Of course, uh, it's got the tail end of it missing. But it says began writing on the ground. So a lot of times in church, I know growing up, or even since I've been a Christian, uh, you always, there's always like this, you know, God writing on the ground. Jesus writing on the ground, you know, with his finger. And since I've been a Christian, I go, well, what is, it? What is he writing, though? I mean, I've always been curious what, he, what he's writing. And so I, when I texted my brother-in-law, and he told me to make a record, that made so much sense to me. Here they are bringing this woman who's caught in adultery, and the Jewish leadership wants her stoned to death. Where's the man? You ever thought about that? Where's the guy? Thou art the man. Thou art the man. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, it was a setup. You know, and of course, we know what they were doing to Christ. They were trying to hem him up and everything. But it's funny that in Deuteronomy 22, the, 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 uh, punishment, the punishment for adultery, all these different things is death. Okay? But yet here they are bringing this woman to Christ and they're like, here you go. What are you going to do? What are you going to do, Lord? Or Jesus, they didn't call him Lord. But, um, 
That's, that's right. That's right. Where is the man? So you have the, the woman here being brought up. And, and, and they're not bringing the man forward. And Jesus knows. Jesus understands what they're doing. He understands their manipulation. He understands that they're trying to uh, put him in a corner, you know, paint him, paint him in a corner. And so he knows it. And so Jesus, what he does is he just stoops down and begins writing on the ground. But it's much deeper than that. I think, I know we got to be careful when we start getting in scripture and talking about what we think. But this isn't scriptural, by the way. Let me throw that caveat out there. I, I, I believe, I, I'm thinking what Christ did was when they brought this woman forward w- without the man and they're trying to do these different things and trying to corner Jesus and catch him in a trap, that when Jesus wrote on the ground, remember, Kate Grafen really syntactically means makes a record he started I believe he started writing out what they had been doing and they could see it because why in the world why in the world would they drop their stones and just walk away yes Right. Right. That's right. That's right. This is what you do. And that's a, that makes a good point. He's writing their names. So and so was with you on, you know, possibly with that same woman, you know, and he's got their name and he's writing their ledger down. So he's writing their name in the ledger, and, and because. Okay. right right they see their name and they're probably like don't go tell my wife you know and and so they're backing away and that's to me when you tie this verse in right here you tie that word in um it adds so much deeper meaning that one word right there took how many english words to describe it that's why greek is so neat I mean, it has one word has such deep meaning that we have to, we, we in the English language try to draw out, and sometimes we can't even do it. We try to draw out the meaning of a word. And um, that's what we come up with. So we, we see, he began writing on the ground, and we've probably all been taught, you know, with, with, he's writing with his finger. Hey, you know, Christ is, I, I, and again, I don't believe he stooped down and started drawing a picture of a horse carriage. You know what I mean? And, and drawing clouds. You know, he, he wasn't like doodling, you know. He's, like Miss Lorraine was saying, he, I would imagine he's writing the names of the men that were probably with this same woman in that crowd because what would make them drop their stones like they did? Y'all, we understand that, that Jews, when they, uh, the, these, these crimes like this, adultery, they had the authority, even under the Roman government, to stone you. That's why they kept wanting to stone Jesus. Jesus would slip away. They wanted to stone this woman here. They stoned Stephen for blasphemy. So Jews, because there's, there's a notion out there that Jews weren't allowed to commit or weren't allowed to execute anyone because the Roman government would allow them. But that's not right. That's not true because they, they were allowed to stone. That was part of their Jewish law that they could stone you if you broke any of their Jewish laws or customs. And so there was times that they wanted to stone Jesus, but he would, he would get away from them. They're trying to stone this woman here. They're trying to they stone Stephen. So they, so they stone Paul, you know. So they crucified Jesus because they wanted him to be a political criminal. He, was, he became a political criminal. That's why, you know, because, because Jews did not, Jews did not um, do, uh, perform crucifixion. They stoned you. Um, but Romans, the Roman government, crucified you and that was one of the reasons why the Jews wanted Christ to go to the Roman government and when Christ is claiming to be king you know that's a threat to the Roman authority because remember the Jews thought that the Messiah when he came he was going to overthrow that 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 uh that Roman uh system 
And when they find out that Jesus isn't the one trying to overthrow the Roman system, they're like, well, he's, he's not the guy then. So they turn Jesus over to the, the Roman authorities as a political criminal. And that's one of the reasons why Jesus wasn't stoned. And so, you ever thought about that? You ever thought about, well, why didn't they? Because they were trying to stone Jesus in the beginning, but they didn't actually end up stoning. They actually ended up they actually ended up killing him through a Roman crucifixion. And it all ties in together when you think about why they did it. Uh, humiliation, the humiliation of Christ. So I believe, uh, I think there's one more slide, but it just gets in the, De the Deuteronomy text. Yeah, if you can read that, you have some good eyes on you. <laughs> so, but uh, that's just the, 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 the Deuteronomy text talking about um, why, uh, what, what happened if you committed adultery and, and the punishment for it was death by stoning. Now, did you know that a priest's daughter, if she was caught, she got burned? It's interesting. So the preacher's kid, so the preacher's kid, the priest's daughter, they would actually, that uh, it was um, commanded that a priest's daughter would be burned by fire. So that's a, that's one of those things that you find when you when you're reading through scripture, like, okay, stone, stone, stone. Oh, wait a minute. Oh, that's burning right there. But anyway, so I, that's why I wanted to bring up this text tonight. Tonight was uh there was there was twofold. I wanted to show you uh a little bit about textual criticism. It get it gets mind boggling deeper than what we went through tonight. It it it's it's a cure for any insomniac. <laughs> you start getting into textual criticism, if you have problems sleeping You'll, you won't have any problems sleeping anymore. But, you know, these are things that in the church uh, that we don't really think about because we're with like-minded brothers and sisters. We have no problems with these things. But we have a, we have a culture outside these doors that they're, they're asking these questions. And I wouldn't say they're asking new questions. They're asking the same old questions that's been under the sun for centuries. Um, but the textual criticism questions are, are fairly new because it's been within the last three or 400 years where we've come across all these manuscripts and all these copies of manuscripts. And so people are trying to challenge us. Um, and so tonight what I wanted to show you is that it, when you talk to someone out there and they're, and they're trying to hit you on, you know, because it happened to me. Who would ever thought, you know, I'd, I'd have been in, in a... In an, in an environment where I'm being challenged by the iner inerrancy of God, the Word of God, I mean, you know, from a chaplain. So you, you wouldn't think that. Um, so as Christians, you know, all of us, we don't just confine ourselves to Wachula. We're out there witnessing the people, evangelizing. And when, when it comes up, when it comes up at the water, uh, um, at, at the water, or what do they call it, the water cooler, right, yeah, that whole water cooler thing, and you're talking with someone about these things and, and they're asking about this, just, just know that textual criticism isn't a bad thing. It's actually pointing us and leading us to some of the original manuscripts, uh, what, they, what they said. Um, and then, uh, and tonight, so I took one of those manuscripts that, that's in question and we just kind of walked through it and went through it and then kind of uh, talked about how... Uh, it, what an interesting thought was what, what Jesus was writing on the ground. So I believe, yes, I do believe this verse, this passage is, is authentic. It should be in our Bibles. Um, and if, it, if we ever find out one day in glory that it wasn't, well, it doesn't make us heretics, you know. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm, all right, yeah. 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 That's right. That's right.
Yes. Yes. All right. Yes. Yes. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I, if we can understand that committees, they're not inspired, you know, that's, we have to, that's when we, we have to really break it down. That's, okay, listen, this, this committee was not inspired. You know, they're, they're faithful. I believe they're faithful. Um, but they're not one of the original 40 authors. You know, um, yeah, they, they knew the language, yeah. They knew the Greek. And so, best scholars, and so... When you combine that along with all the evidence we have, the evidence stacks over a mile high. And so that gives us confidence. You know, it gives me confidence. And, and, um, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's true. I can't plumb the depths of it. You know, we spent our whole lives and never really plumbed the dip. Yeah. Oh. Uh. Yeah, the... The, the, yes, sir, the one on top is the English transliteration of it. Um, yes, yes, that's the reference, reference numbers. And then um, the bottom is showing you, that, that the V is showing you that it's a verb. And uh, so the very, the very end where it says 3S, that's uh, third person singular. And uh, the, the, so then, it, I can't remember what the 2A in the middle is, uh, in the middle part is, the two, uh, one, one, IIA or whatever it is. But like if you look to the left over there, like for example, where it says his finger, Doctulo, to the left, um, it's saying that's a noun, um, demonstrative, masculine, singular. And they just break, that just helping you out, you know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. A thousand different ways. And put it in however you want to. And so that's pretty neat. Yep. Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this in prayer. And so, Father, Lord, your disciples ask you how to pray. The Lord, you told them to pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespassers as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Because thine is the kingdom, the power, and glory forever and ever. In your name, amen. And so, I, I take this off here.